Hey guys, it's Felicia. I just want to take a few minutes before we start the show to give you a quick update about what's going on with me. Yay. So if you haven't already heard, I'm back in corporate America. Yay. I'm getting paychecks. I'm getting paychecks. Yeah. So uh, sister needed a J-O-B. Because I have been super busy, I haven't been able to talk to y'all. There may be some emails I haven't got to respond to. Doesn't mean I'm not going to get to it. I just moved across the country and started a new job. So I hope you guys can give me some grace. Bear with me. I'm going to respond to your email. I promise you have not gone unnoticed. I just have been super, super busy trying to get my whole life together. And with that said, over the course of the next couple of weeks, maybe a couple times a couple of weeks, we'll see, I will be replaying remixes of season two episodes, the most listened to and downloaded episodes. Some of you guys who are new to the podcast probably haven't had a chance to hear these. The great thing is my editor, Chris, is going to make these episodes amazeballs and edit them because last season I was editing myself. Mm. Whew, child. If you go back and listen to them, you could tell. So if you love it, email me at ask at trillionba.com. Let me know if you like this episode, what you like about it. Um, if you like any of the episodes, what you like about them. I welcome any feedback, critique, criticism. Just don't curse me out, y'all. That's all I ask. So I want you guys to have a great week. Remember, you are awesome. Forget what anybody says. You rock. All you got to do is do your best because that's all I'm doing. I'm just doing my best and let God take care of the rest. So I love you guys. Thank you for listening to the show. Now let's start this remix. Welcome to the Trill NBA show. I'm your host, Felicia Ann Rose Anuha, a.k.a. the Trillist NBA you will ever know. And I'm here to help you survive and thrive in corporate America by giving you the truth and being as real as only I can be. Today, we talk about getting the MBA. For those who don't know, that's Masters of Business Administration. Every fall, thousands of newly admitted MBA students embark on a new road on their life journey. For many, this is an exciting and meaningful time in their lives. For some, it's the beginning of a huge career and financial mistake, though. The question to ask yourself, is this a road I should walk down? Should you spend the time and money to gain an MBA? Well... There are many things you should consider before you start on an MBA journey. That is what I'm going to talk about today. The good, the bad, and the ugly of getting the MBA. But before I get into it, first, let me set up some foundation to my point of view on this topic. First, I am very biased toward two-year full-time MBA programs. And that's a whole nother show. But I will say, unless you have a specific strategy and are 10 plus years into your career, executive and part-time programs just will not benefit you. Nor will they benefit your classmates the way that they are designed to benefit all of the students in the program. And you can fight me on this. I'm also biased towards top 20 MBA programs because the network and the ROI, which is return on investment, will always be exponentially higher over your lifetime 
than an MBA from a lesser ranked or non-ranked program. The power of the network alone at a top 20 school can be worth it, especially when you think about schools like Harvard and Stanford and Wharton. Those networks are so powerful that the cost of going to school actually becomes worth it. When you have a strategic plan of action and you're intentional about what you're trying to get out of the MBA experience. So foundationally, that's where everything I'm going to talk about today comes from, that thought process. And I know a lot of you might be butthurt right now because you're saying, well, I didn't go to a top 20 school and I'm doing well in my career. And I'm sure you are. Where you go to school and what you're doing with your life, in all actuality, like the MBA should be icing on the cake. You're never going to have one thing that's going to stop you on your journey. So do I believe you can go outside of the conventional thinking I just laid out and be successful? Absolutely. If you look around, there are a lot of people who have no degrees at all, and they are highly successful in their careers, in their businesses. And they make a lot of money. So this is not the end all be all. This is just my take on the journey that I've gone down and the things that I've learned in the past 10 years of my beginning or my start to my MBA journey. So first, we're going to talk about the good. And it's my favorite part. And it's the longest list that I have. I'll start with my story of why did I go and get my MBA? And I'm going to be completely trill about it. So I got my MBA because I wanted to make more money. Now, that's not the thing that you're supposed to stay while you're on your journey. But that is the absolute truth. One day at work, I was working for a retailer that's headquartered in the South. And this was prior to me going to get my MBA. Two of my best friends had graduated from law school the same year. So this was 2006. And I'll never forget this. I got an email and it said, hey, guys, let's go to Costa Rica for the weekend. And I was like, oh, wow, I've never been out of the country. (laughs) So I would need to get my passport. I'd have to buy a plane ticket. I'd have to buy new clothes for my trip because it's Costa Rica. I'd have to buy some new luggage too. So there was a considerable amount of money that I would have to outlay for a weekend in Costa Rica. And at the time I was making like $17.50 an hour, which equated to about $36,000 a year, give or take. And I'll never forget, I looked up how much just the plane ticket was going to be. And at the time I lived in Dallas and the plane ticket from DFW to Costa Rica was like 700 and some dollars, which was 200 and some dollars more than my rent because my rent was about $500 at the time. And I will never forget that feeling of inadequacy that I had. And I realized, oh, This bitch is about to leave me. I'm about to be the broke friend. I was like, hell (laughs) no. I'm not going to be the broke friend. So next thing I know, I'm studying for the GMAT. And that was the beginning of my MBA journey. I did not want to be the broke friend. And I wanted to be able to go on any vacation that I got invited to. Now, the funny part is, We still have not been to Costa Rica for the weekend. So ladies, you know who you are. We're going to have to remedy that. (laughs) That was the beginning of an interesting journey for me. I ended up actually taking another job after that job to make more money, which still was only like $50,000 a year. And so then I realized, you know, after doing my research, wow, I can make six figures like my friends that have these law gigs. So the first and best thing about getting your MBA 
is the opportunity to get jobs that pay you six figures right out the bat at graduation. Like you're getting a signing bonus. You're getting a hundred thousand dollars a year according on, you know, if you take a conventional route. And that's what I'm talking about here. If you take a conventional route via functions such as marketing, finance, investment banking, consulting, and operations management, you're going to land that type of job coming out of one of these top programs. So high paying jobs and i.e. six figure jobs right out the bat, that's the best thing to me about the MBA. The other thing that's really great about going to get your MBA is that you get to take a career break. You get a chance to reset, recharge, focus. And if you do it right, you get to really set yourself up for the next phase of your career. And if you take that 22 months that you're in this full-time MBA program and really do the work and dig into your soul to figure out like, what is it that I'm really supposed to be doing here? Um, If you take time to do that, and you'll have to take away time from socializing to do so. But if you do that, this experience, it makes it so much greater than anything you'll ever do in your career. Now, the other thing, and I said socializing, but socializing is really networking in the MBA program. And so the third best thing about the MBA program is the network that you build and this lifelong relationship with different alums and colleagues that you meet along the way. And all of these people help to enhance your career. They serve as mentors, personal board of directors, and they help you figure out when you get in sticky situations, how to handle it, how to get out of it, and how to come out on top. So some people might say, well, that sounds like it's better than this career break in the money. And then, yeah, it might be, but this is how I'm ranking it. (laughs) And I would say another great thing for Black women specifically is that there are two great programs where you can earn a full fellowship to top MBA schools. The first program is the consortium, and I will link this episode to an episode from season one where I talked with Danny Young, director of admissions at the consortium. I am a consortium fellow. I am a consortium alum. I am sold out for consortium. You cannot tell me anything wrong. Even if I know it is, I will fight you just like I will fight you over Texas. I will fight you over the consortium. But this program has been amazing. Every job contact or opportunity that I've ever gotten actually has come through this additional plus up of my network from business school. So not only do I have my business school alumni network, but I also have my consortium classmate network. And it has just been an amazing opportunity that I've been blessed to be a part of. So you can learn more about the consortium in the link. I won't go into too much detail here. But the second program, which I'm I'm learning about, is called Forte. And Forte is a program specifically for women to help women in business and to grow the number of women who are represented in business spaces through the MBA program. So much like the consortium, the consortium is focused on underrepresented minorities. Forte is focused on representation of women, which is still low, very low in the higher ranks of corporate America. So these two programs are truly doing the Lord's work. And I am excited to be affiliated with both. And I'll be happy if anybody wants to hit me up at asktrillmba.com. I'll be happy to connect you to representatives of each program if you are looking to get more information. But besides those two programs, there's lots of programs within different functions. Another organization I belong to is the National Black MBA Association. I am a lifetime member. It's been a great journey. We're doing a lot of great work. So all of this stems from all of this goodness in my life stems from the fact that I got the MBA. Had I never gotten my MBA, I wouldn't 
have the experiences that I've been afforded so far. That's the good part about the NBA. Now I want to talk about the bad. (laughs) First off, the worst thing about the NBA journey, in my humble opinion, is the GMAT. That is the absolute worst thing about it. The GMAT is a soul-sucking, unfortunately useless test, in my opinion, that allows business schools to somehow have another data point of criteria. Somehow it's supposed to make it fair, the admissions process, right? It's a crock. Like the whole test is a crock. In fact, they've shown, they have studies that show that there is a reverse correlation at some point where you're over 700 on your GMAT, how well you're going to do as a manager or senior leader in corporate America. You're, it, there's an inverse correlation. So the higher you get on the GMAT, the worse manager you're likely to be. So if you got over a 700 on the GMAT and you manage people now, I need you to go right now, look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself truly, are you a good manager? Because odds are you suck (laughs) just because you just don't have the good people skills. It's not your fault. You're hella smart. You're just not that great of a manager. So if you feel your if your spirit is tingling right now and you feel a certain way about what I just said. Again, do some self-assessment. Get a 360 from your employees and find out, are you this terrible manager or not? The other thing that sucks about going to get your MBA is the actual application process. It's time consuming. There are these essays. These schools, it's a game. They expect to see and hear certain language, certain lingo in these applications in order to let you in. And you really have to ask a lot of questions and you really have to be open to doing something different in order to get into the school that you really want to get into. And you have to figure out what type of class is this business school building And how can I make it shown through my application that I would be a perfect fit for that class? At the end of this, I'm going to go through the MBA game and how you have to focus on your best possible outcome, because I know that might not make much sense. What are you talking about? There's way they're building the class and do I fit in the class? What do you mean? After I get through the bad and the ugly, I'm going to break down the game of the NBA. But right now I'm going to stick with the framework that I've started out with and finish talking about the bad. So the application process, the GMAT, ugh, bad. The other bad thing that's really bad is the debt accumulation. (laughs) Even when you get a fellowship, guess what? Unless you have abundance of savings to burn through, To live off of for 22 months and some change until you start working again, then you're most likely going to have to take out some loans to get through so you can eat and have somewhere to sleep. Those things are important. So I got some student loans from grad school. They're manageable. They're not killing me. But again, I also had a full fellowship for tuition and fees. Now, let's say you don't have a fellowship or savings and you full on take out the entire cost of your 22 months of MBA program. God bless you people. And that's probably the real bad thing (laughs) when you get no financial assistance and you don't have rich parents. You really have to be strategic about doing this because that could be upwards of $200,000 of debt that you're signing up for and you're not going to be a doctor. So, yeah. And then the other thing that's bad about the MBA that they don't tell you about is that after you go a conventional path, for example, 
I'm in marketing. Let's say I wanted to switch to finance, which I don't know what planet that would have to happen on. But let's just say I was like, you know, I'm really interested in the finance function and I want to, you know, create P&Ls for the organization. Um, yeah, you're not really going to be able to do that. Like I have yet to meet somebody who's successfully done anything like that. I think I might have met somebody who switched from finance to marketing and that was an serious undertaking. But I have yet to meet that. That was one person. It just doesn't really happen. So it's kind of like once you're in a lane, you're stuck. And I don't like that. That just sucks. Just know that it's really hard to switch careers after you finish B-School. So that's why you got to do that due diligence up front and spend that time to make sure that this is really what you want to get into. Now, let's talk about the ugly. Woo! Ugly. There is a lot of BS that goes on behind the scenes of these MBA programs. And you have to make sure that you are not getting caught up in the mess. So your school choice and your rankings Unfortunately, they matter. And I know a lot of people, again, are going to feel a certain kind of way because they went to schools that weren't necessarily ranked or they were more regional schools or maybe you even went to the University of Phoenix for your MBA. Now, look, I'm going to tell you right now. Good luck to you. You can do anything in the world that you put your mind to with your University of Phoenix MBA. You can, but understand, you're never going to get treated like a Harvard MBA. Hell, I went to Indiana and I'm never going to get treated like a Harvard MBA. (laughs) Let's be real clear. Not saying that I'm going to be stopped in my journey, just saying that I won't get to experience some of the perks. (laughs) And I'll probably have to work a a little or a lot harder to prove myself because I don't have a Harvard or Stanford MBA. So understand it's hard to get into those schools, but once you're in, you're in. And that network and that name and that branding is so powerful. And let's be real, like I'm going to keep it true. I've worked with some Harvard MBAs. I've worked with some people that went to MIT. Mediocre. Say it with me. Mediocre. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. Because you know why? We're all human beings and we all have our strengths and we all have our weaknesses. And a lot of the corporate game is about who likes you. And we talked about that in the likability episode. So... If you have this name brand MBA and you're quite likable, you could get away with actually not doing much of shit at your job. And everybody will love the lack of production that comes from you because you're a likable Harvard MBA. Now, if you feel a certain kind of way about that, go look at yourself in the mirror again and let it sink in and and work on yourself. Okay, now the other ugly truth about the NBA is that it is not, heed my words, not an equalizer for us Black women. It does not put us on a level playing field whatsoever. It gives us another checkbox that may open a couple of doors, but in actuality, it is not an equalizer. And let me give you an example. I used to work with a young lady who I actually really like, just love this this person. Cool as a fan. And I'll never forget my first couple of months at work. This person was on a panel for new employees. And she talked about how she didn't have an MBA. And she was talking to the more junior associates in the company and that she works her way up through the company and you don't need to go back and get an MBA to be successful. Now, what she didn't tell you 
was that her father used to be a senior executive in the company and had retired. That's what she didn't tell you. So it's all nice and dandy to tell people, you don't need this MBA. You can be successful. Look at me. But you got to put everything in the context. What are the odds that my father is going to be a senior executive at any company that I'm working at? The odds are zero. Okay. Z and Ro, zero. <laughs> so understand that within the company, she has this built in network of senior executives who have respect for her father. And she does great work. Don't get me wrong. Like, she, as a woman, you still got to come in and bring the brass tacks, right? Like, she ain't mediocre at all. But I think she did a disservice especially to the junior associates of color who were contemplating getting their MBA. No, boo-boo, you going to need your MBA because your daddy didn't work here, okay? So let's be real clear about it. And that's the ugly of the MBA. We need it to check the box to get in the door. It's not something that we can go without in certain spaces. We can't just rise the ranks. We'll get beat out. It'll become a reason to not promote us. Well, she doesn't have her MBA. Whereas for homegirl, nobody will ever, ever hold her back because she doesn't have an MBA, at least not in that organization. Now, I will say, let her try to go outside that organization and see what happens. Eh, she has good experience. She might make it. Who knows? Now. Let's talk about this game because the other ugly part is getting caught up in the NBA game and going the status quo route, the path of least resistance. Oh, all these companies are interviewing me for marketing. So I guess I need to go the marketing route based on my prior experience. Okay, listen to me and listen to me well. Let me break this down for you. Before you go and get an MBA, you really need to really be secure in what it is that you want to do post MBA. Because if you're not, then a lot of opportunities are just going to come at you and you're going to start feeling this huge sense of FOMO, fear of missing out. And you're going to believe that you have to say yes to all the doors with no direction. People are going to come to you. Companies that you would never be interested in in a million years are going to come and do their song and dance and take you out to eat and fly you here and talk about how great it would be to work there. And you'll be like, oh, my goodness, I just never thought about this option. Child, don't get caught up in that. Here's the game. Now take some notes because this is important. You need to understand the game and understand where you fit into it so that you can get your best possible outcome. So let's talk about the players. The first player you have is the school. These schools make the widgets. Who are the widgets? Why, you are the student. You are the widget. So the school sells the widget to the corporations who come on campus and wine and dine you and meet you. And they actually court the widgets because the widgets actually have minds of their own. (laughs) But those are the three players in this game. You have the customer, who is the company, the school, who is the manufacturer, and the widget, who are the students. Now, let's think about what it is that each of these players are trying to accomplish. Let's start with the school. The school listens to the companies that come and recruit at their school. And they say, what type of students are you looking for to build your talent pipeline? And then the school gets that information, synthesizes it, 
and says, okay, we're gonna build a class that looks like this. We're gonna find some people that would be great employees for this company and that company, and then this company said they needed this. And they start by creating a class profile. And then they start looking at the different applicants and find the strongest candidates to fill the class. And they create these classes. And these classes are designed purposefully to be the widgets for the companies that come and recruit at their school. So if you know that there's a certain, like you have this dream company that you want to work for and there's a certain thing you want to do, do your research on the MBA program and look and see like, okay, this company recruits here and here. Look at the classes that have graduated. Where are those people? What kind of function are they in? What type of jobs are they doing now? Use LinkedIn as a resource here. And you really want to look as you're writing your application and you want to show yourself as the next person, the next widget that could be sold to this company. That's how you work to get into the school. You have to understand what their motivation is for even looking at your application and talking to you. With the companies, they're trying to build a certain talent pipeline. Now, that's a little bit harder to understand unless you know somebody who works for that company and then you can get a sense of what type of employees are they looking for. And then you can start working backwards to tie that together in the rhetoric that you hear from the school and then the rhetoric you hear from the company. And you just have to pay attention. Are things adding up? Are they matching up? And is this somewhere where my personal values align with the school and the company? And when you find that place, that's probably a good school for you to go to. Now, you have to be careful because sometimes a school could need more students who are going to do X. Let's just say marketing, keep it simple. So if the school needs more, widgets to do marketing, they're going to throw at you all the reasons why marketing is a great function to get your MBA in when they know that you're not clear about what it is that you want to do. Now, in your essays, you'll make up some great stuff because they're always going to ask the question, why do you want to get your MBA? They ask you that, but they know you don't know what the hell you want. And over 70%, and I could be making this up, pulling it out my butt, but I'd bet money on this. 70% of people go into MBA programs with an open mind, meaning my mind is open to be changed, to be molded, to be told what I should be doing with my life because I don't know. And all my friends went to go get graduate degrees and I don't want to get left because I was told this is what I was supposed to do. And I made good on the GMAT and my grades are decent. And so here I am. I'm in the MBA program. Yay. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Schools bank on that. Let's be real clear. (laughs) They just want to see if you can tell a good story. Because that's half the battle of getting you sold to the customer, or which are the companies. So now that you understand this MBA game, your goal should be to set yourself up for your best possible outcome. This takes a lot of time and a lot of soul searching and a lot of research. Don't skimp on this, whatever you do, because what will happen is either you do the work before you get your MBA, you do the work while you're in your MBA program your first year, or you get out, you're in a job, you're at a company that you should not be at because you let somebody con you into coming to the company and you just thought this would be such a great idea. And then you look up three years later and you're like, what the hell was I thinking? (laughs) Don't let that be you. Really work by after your internship, which is a good point to really sit there 
and sit with yourself and say, what did I like about my summer internship? What didn't I like about my summer internship? What is it that I really want to do post MBA with my career and my life? And don't waste time. Don't waste time doing things that you think is the right thing to do because you don't know what you really should be doing. Do the work. Do not go into this MBA lightly because this is your life. You've got to get intentional about what you're going to do with the time you've been given on this earth. In conclusion, should you get an MBA? It depends. I got my MBA and I don't regret it. It has opened up many doors for me. One thing I do know, or I'm very confident about, I can't say I know, no, but I'm very confident of the fact that I can always get a job. I can always pay my bills. I can always get money. I have a certain skill set now that nobody can take away from me. And that gives me peace of mind at night. So for that, I'm grateful for my MBA. I'm grateful for the experience at Indiana University Kelly School of Business. I'm grateful for my network and my classmates that I keep in touch with all over the world. I'm happy that I got my MBA. I just encourage you to do your research. Do your work before you embark on this journey. Understand what you're getting into. I always tell people to, to get your best possible outcome, you want to go to the highest ranked school where you feel the most comfortable because that's your network. And if you can't get along with the people that you're in school with, you have wasted your time and money. So make sure that you go to a school that you can really rally behind the rest of your career. So MBA or not, just know that I'm always here for advice. (laughs) Feel free to email me at ask at trillmba.com. I'm happy to either answer your question or connect you to the right person if I don't have the answer. Again, that email is ask, A-S-K, at trillmba.com. Until next time, keep it trill, y'all. The Trill MBA Show is a Fair World Corp. LLC production. Executive produced by Felicia and Rose Inuha. Sound design and editing by Chris Mann with Podshaper. Theme music is Kick Push by Ryan Little. Keep it trill every day, y'all.